This is a film with Aisha Akanbi, who is a stylist and cultural commentator, probably best known for her film, The Problem with Wokeness, that went viral a couple of years ago. I think wokeness has robbed many a people of um, compassion and replaced it with moral superiority. Compassion and empathy is paramount to any social movement and to any form of progress. Once you have compassion and empathy, you can often see that you have a lot more in common with people than you do apart. And it's the system under which we live in that forcefully tries to group us on our differences. What is radical is kindness. What is radical is understanding. That's the one thing they don't want us to do is to understand each other. Arguing with each other isn't actually radical at all. It's very conformist, actually. I do think that wokeness does run the risk sometimes in reducing very complex issues. Wokeness tends to be quite reactionary instead of responsive. And so when you react, you go off of emotion and you go off of anger, resentment, humiliation. And that doesn't necessarily leave much space for nuance. And nuance is important in order to understand the interconnectedness of the issues. And I think it's fair to say that the issues that she talked about in that film have become even more relevant in the time since. So I caught up with her in London to talk about many things, including how her life has changed since that film came out. That was the first thing I'd ever done that went viral and that was really scary actually. Um, I really didn't expect it to um, at all. And maybe something I didn't fully appreciate at the time was I think right now it's very rare to see someone uh, with my um, identity essentially who is willing to say those things in public. Um, I didn't actually know at the time that they were controversial. Um, I just really thought that this was common sense. And, and I think it is to many people, which is why it's so maddening that we're in this position that we're in right now. And the paradox of her talking about how we needed to get beyond the politics of identity, but her words being taken more seriously and having more resonance because of her identity. I'm being honest and I'm speaking from my heart and I'm glad that it resonates with people, but the idea that it should only resonate with people because I am black is something that's hard for me to, um, to swallow and digest because, I don't know, I just think we're, we're allowing ourselves to, um, we're, we're, we're creating the ground to be easily manipulated if we're only going to take someone at their word because of their identity. Um, because, yeah, it's not actually that important to me, if I'm honest. Like, being black, uh, being a woman, uh, my sexuality, uh, these are probably the least interesting things about me. Um, and I do think that we'll be in a good place when they're the, most, the least interesting things about us all. And how her criticisms of ideology came from a really deep spiritual transformation that she'd gone through. Although what I'm doing can be seen as political, and I understand that, um, it's very much not that, as far as I'm concerned. It's very much a, um, a, a spiritual kind of journey that I'm just sharing out loud with people. Um, and I see the spiritual journey as um, trying to... Um, trying to get towards truth, you know, and, and allowing oneself to be curious. And, and I find a lot of these movements to be anti-curious. Um, and that's very troublesome for me because as long as we're not curious, we won't understand things. And as long as we don't understand things, uh, those things can control us. For me, what I find so powerful about your, that, that film and your work more generally is that you're coming from a very empathetic place. I think there are lots of people now saying, controversial things or pushing back on wokeness, mm -hmm. but it often feels like it's coming from a quite a re reactionary place. And there's a, there's a huge market for that as well. But what I love about your, the way you framed it is that you framed it in a very empathetic way. And, and in a way, it's like the, the flaw with wokeness as an ideology is that it's a performative empathy, but it's not actually particularly yes. empathetic. Mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you frame that? How do, you, how do you kind of keep that empathy when you're talking about these things? Well, I think it's always important to remember your own sort of humble, you know, beginnings in terms of your own thoughts and ideas. And I was very much someone at one point who was quite susceptible to some woke ideas. What I think a large section of the left, I think they're very... Um, fixated on being socially aware. That's what it is to be woke, is to be socially aware. And what I really think it would really benefit from is if um, the mission statement was to be as self-aware as it is socially aware. 
to prioritize um, self-reflection. Um, but I don't often think it does that because it positions itself as, you know, being on the right side of history. It's one of the good guys. And, and the problem is when you consider yourself solely through the lens of being a good person is that um, you don't often feel the need to self-reflect. That's for everybody else. Even in the word woke, suggest to me that they are looking for some form of awakening you know but the problem with the word woke is that it's finished it's not awakening it's not waking it's you know done we know it all you know it's like saying enlightened what i think is missing from their methodology is maybe like a degree of um a sort of like humanistic or, or spiritual type of you know framework uh, it doesn't have that I, I think it lacks a lot of humility there's the paradox that you're saying that you'd like identity characteristics to be much less important but there is you are being listened to partly because of your identity characteristics mm -hmm. and you're able to say certain things that if i was to say for example they would they would not be taken as seriously because people would assume that i'm defending male privilege or um, white privilege or something like that. How do you kind of square that, yeah. that paradox? It's, it's somewhat bittersweet because um, I'm very aware that a lot of what I'm saying can only be said by someone who looks like me. And I, and I wonder how long I can even say it. You know, I mean, I haven't, uh, there's been no sort of campaign to cancel me yet, uh, but I, I won't hold my breath on that because, you know, it. It comes for everyone, eventually. Um, but, what I, but what I say to a lot of people when they, um, they are uh, responsive to the things that I'm saying and, and they're taking something positive from it, you know, I let them know that, I mean, there is no difference from me saying this and some, you know, a, a white man, you know, a white straight man. Like, I could have all types of intentions that you know you wouldn't be aware of you can't just suggest you can't just think because i am black you know that that is a um i don't know that sort of purifies you know this message i mean i'm being honest and i'm speaking from my heart and i'm glad that it resonates with people but the idea that it should only resonate with people because i am black is something that's hard for me to um to swallow and digest because um, I don't know, I just think we're, we're allowing ourselves to, um, we're, we're creating the ground to be easily manipulated if we're only going to take someone at their word because of their identity. Um, because, yeah, it's not actually that important to me, if I'm honest, like being black, uh, being a woman, uh, my sexuality, uh, these are probably the least interesting things about me. Um, and I do you think that we'll be in a good place when they're the most, the least interesting things about us all, you know? And that doesn't mean, again, that I'm saying that we should um, deny where we're from and deny that we have cultures that are different and, and we can learn and borrow and, and, and mix uh, from that place. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not fundamental. Um, I don't know, David, I, I think it's a, it's a tricky one, knowing that I can only say this because of uh, my identity but at the same time I mean it needs to be said mm. you know it very much needs to be said and um, it needs to be said by I guess someone who you know you can't easily read some sort of ill intention from um, but yeah I don't know at the same time I I would encourage people uh, in to know that you know, your identity is not synonymous with virtue. You know, I, anyone can be ill-intended or well-intended. Watching some of the, the interviews with you before doing this, I was really struck by how much you've gone on a personal spiritual journey. Do you think that influences your understanding of the sort of ideologies? Yes, um, completely. You know, I, I often think it's a bad word because, or not a bad word, but it's an unhelpful word because it has so many connotations, the word spiritual. Um, but. I perceive the word spiritual to be um, an uncovering of yourself, you know, an uncovering of yourself and, and through that uncovering uh, the discovery or redefinition of those people that are around you. And, and that's the frame through which I understand most things, if not all things. Um, so although what I'm doing can be seen as political, and I understand that, um, it's very much not that, as far as I'm concerned. It's very much a, um, 
a, a spiritual kind of journey that I'm just sharing out loud with people. Um, and, and I see the spiritual journey as um, trying to um, trying to get towards truth, you know, and, and allowing oneself to be curious. And, and I find a lot of these movements to be anti-curious. Um, and that's very troublesome for me because as long as we're not curious, we won't understand things. And as long as we don't understand things, uh, those things can control us. Um, because I, I do believe a lot of those people are on a search. Um, what they may be searching for, they may not know, uh, but it's a search. And, you know, when I realized that the thing that I was looking for couldn't really be found externally, you know, I tried to find a tribe, I tried to find a group, and I, I recognized there was too much of a compromise of principles sometimes, values, things that are honest to you, in order to get this group membership. Um, you couldn't truly be yourself, you know, and, and it felt to me that part of this journey was about truly getting to, to know yourself. Um, so it just wasn't compatible. But, you know, I think when we have a more of a, um, a holistic understanding of ourselves, uh, I do think it really shifts the way that we see other people. You know, I think as there's that saying, you know, we don't really see people how they are, we see them how we are. Um, so it's within my interest and, you know, what I encourage for people to truly get to know themselves in the most expansive way possible, because then we um, extend that to everyone else. I remember before this journey happened, it, it felt like a dark night of the soul because before this um, kick started, I remember being in bed and it was a tearful night and I didn't expect it to be. I wasn't necessarily sad, but I remember all of a sudden my mind just uh, played a slideshow of all these unsettling um, questions, you know. So I was asking myself, you know, who was I jealous of or what, you know, what made me envious and why I was doing the job that I wanted to do and who are my friends and, you know, like, are you, is this love or are you bored? Just, you know, all these kind of questions. and. Um, all the answers to the questions at that point were, were so uncomfortable and they were so raw um, that I, I just sort of melted, if I'm honest, and uh, I just never been the same since. And for a long time, it was very, um, it was a very sort of, it was a journey that was full of a lot of anguish and, and, and full of a lot of pain, uh, but it was all very necessary to go through. Yeah, and I, I really am um, grateful, you know, if there's anything I call a privilege, it's that experience. Mm. Where, how would you describe where you find yourself now at the end of that? Mm. Um, I, I don't know that I'm at the end of that, you know, to be honest, but I'm in a much more still place now. And I don't have a tribe, you know, it doesn't feel like I, I don't feel like I want one. I, I still don't identify politically. It's, it's not a language I'm fluent in. Um, and I think, you know, I, I just see my, my role here is to be as understanding as possible um, and to try and speak in a way that can be felt and understood uh, by anyone, um, regardless of your education level. You know, I truly believe that we can say anything, but it's just about learning how to say those things. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just here to, to connect with people, you know, whoever is also um, committed to some kind of honesty or self-awareness. Uh, but I don't know where I am, if I'm honest. Yeah, I don't know where I am, but it feels like it's quite a solitary place still. Yeah, yeah, I was struck. I, I'm struck by just how much parallels there are between your journey and the journey of, of my journey and Rebel Wisdom and just this sense of, I feel like we all have to kind of cross this this, this valley in some way. I don't know how to define it, but just in the, the process of individuation. And then we spoke just before recording and I mentioned, oh, are you, are you familiar with Carl Jung? And you're like, oh yeah, I'm really familiar with Carl Jung, but I don't normally talk about this. Um, what What maps or what kind of thinkers do you find most useful to understand or to navigate the, the, the journey that you've been on? Mm, definitely uh, Carl Jung, def for sure. Um, you know, what, what Jung says about um, the shadow self, you know, and, and integration, uh, that's really important in my world. And I think a lot of my work 
is is trying to get people to embrace the shadow more is to acknowledge it and to know that it's there first because i don't know if everyone knows that it's there and and to not judge it you know because as long as we are judging these uh, undesirable aspects of ourselves we're going to be defensive about them and we're going to avoid them but if we can learn to just see them as is as opposed to this is bad you know um that for me is very helpful um and also it's it's once you know your shadow or you can see it you're in dialogue with it it's much harder to be demeaning to other people you know for the same type of shadow um so yeah i i find carl jung to be a uh, very um enlightening and helpful uh people like alan watts um comedian like uh george carlin <laughs> i think he was brilliant um Eric Fromm, you know, someone whose book I I read recently, uh I I read um The Art of Loving. Yeah, that was really something and you know, has helped. And also I'm quite into Taoism. Um I find the paradox to be um really familiar you know it's really familiar to the way that my brain works i understand it you know when i was in school i i wasn't particularly a good student you know like i had all these learning difficulties you know dyslexia i'm on the spectrum and um adhd and yeah so much of like the formal education was fairly lost on me uh and then i remember when i came across uh um dao te ching i remember when i came across that and a lot of my you know it's a quite a simple book and it's very small and loads of people were like i just don't understand this it makes no sense and i was like this is the first thing it's ever made sense <laughs> you know um so that was really instrumental in in me coming across um and i would say it's very much like a bible to me it's something i often go back to um so yeah i mean anyone who has like an element of of mysticism within them somewhere even if they they never use such words like but some people have a certain type of energy i don't know you know a lot of people that you've even had on this uh channel yeah i this is a channel actually you know genuinely i don't take in very much actually and i'm not just saying this because i'm on it but um this is a channel that i have yeah found deeply helpful because you know you're interested in the the other side of you know the conversation which doesn't get a lot of attention as you were saying something about young i would, that struck me because i've had this conversation recently about that awareness of the shadow and the uh, the necessity of kind of sitting with it when we react to something out there and not immediately kind of going that's wrong but what is it bringing up in me and you've talked about curiosity as this really important value but that seems essential I mean for woke culture in particular or at least sort of cancel culture the sort of woke culture of that's wrong we need to change it to be able to realize well now actually that's bringing up something in me that I need to look at seems like an essential piece and I don't want to just limit it to that cuz we see that on the right just as much as the left and we see cancel culture on on all sides of the political spectrum like there are certain taboo topics wherever you come from mm-hmm. I would probably agree that it seems more prevalent on the left because mm-hmm. it's kind of the 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 head cultural hegemony at the moment is more on the left than the right but that awareness that self awareness seems so crucial and i think that's what i also really recognize in the 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 perspective that you're bringing because you you really understand that i feel mm. yes um i often think that whatever is most aggravating to us and and anything that elicits this sort of visceral response or reaction that you can't control I think is an unchecked part of yourself. You know, and so I know the moments when there's someone that I just for no reason I sort of instinctively dislike, which is rare. But when that does happen, I'm like, "Oh, your body's telling you something. Oh, here here's something you haven't dealt with." Um and so I'm much more even when it comes to uh wokeness, you know, it's a question I have to ask myself. What is this bringing up? you know why is it that you don't like this or what's so incompatible and of course there are all of the um legit concerns about you know i i see it as an anti-curious movement i see it as um selling self sabotage under the banner of empowerment you know i i see it doing i i see it as aggravating racial tension um all of that is true however there might be this other element that is well you used to be like this a little <laughs> you know you used to be like this and and have you 
have you forgiven yourself for that, you know? And so what I see in a lot of the cancel culture, it seems to me, and a lot of the, this need and desperation to point out who's wrong, you know, and, and make people accountable. This is something I hear people say a lot these days, you know, he needs to be accountable. Um, and I, I find it very interesting, just even that, um, thinking that it's your job to make other people accountable. Um, it seems to me that people are witnessing in other people who they used to be, you know, and they're overcompensating for that. So when they see someone doing something they don't like, it's less about what that person's doing and more about advertising, well, look at who I am, look at who I am no longer. You know, it, it's more about, I, I guess... Or even people... sometimes disowned parts of themselves. Yes, exactly that. Um, so, yeah, I, I see that's what it is. I, you know, I, I, I think I, I wrote it down the other day somewhere. It feels like a war with the unconsciousness. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's something that really... I don't think there's any way out of this uh, culture war dynamic that just seems to be accelerating without that, that acceptance or that kind of dropping into a much deeper perspective mm. that involves psychology, that involves uh, mythology, that involves um, the mythopoetic dimension and certainly the psychological dimension, but I would argue like the, the personal growth or the spiritual dimension as well. I don't think there's a way out from, the, from just the sort of the surface level. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I mean, a lot of what people, of course, you know, there needs to be... Um, um, aspects of political reform and, and governmental change and, um, you know, systemic things happening. Um, however, I often do see a lot of what people are, are looking for externally is, is first going to come by um, some personal transformation, you know, maybe what some would call a spiritual revolution, um, some sort of shared understanding about, you know, what we're doing here. You know, and even if we have different belief systems, that's fine. But just um, some type of shared, you know, perspective of, of what it means to be alive and to be human. I was going to pick up in the last, in your last comment, you mentioned that you felt that wokeness um, aggravates racial tensions. Mm -hmm. I kind of have a feeling what you mean by that, but do you want to kind of unpack yeah. that? So when I say that wokeness aggravates racial tension, what I mean is... You know, it acknowledges rightfully that racism still exists, you know. I think it will also be something that always exists because, you know, we humans are complicated people. But the way that it tries to um, counter, you know, and reduce maybe some of those racist attitudes that exist, I think often can exacerbate them. Um, and so when we are speaking about entire demographics, whether they be white men, white women, um, in ways that we would shudder, you know, break down and just sort of completely erupt at if anyone did the same. Uh, if someone painted, you know, you know, black groups as this one monolithic negative thing, um, it would just be chaos, you know? And so whether it's well-intended, whether it, it's even maybe historically true or something like that, whatever it may be, whatever the justification is, it just, it doesn't play into our human natures very well. You know, you can't, you can't make blanket statements about all one people and think that, you know, this is not gonna give other people license to think, well, okay, well, if we, you know, we're all white and fragile, well then maybe you're all black and frail or whatever it may be, you know, like it's just, um, it just seems to be the most corrosive way to try and understand one another. Um, and even the idea that we need to be hyper aware now of other people's you know, race and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, it seemed like, you know, before that it wasn't so much of, of, of an issue. You know, I could, my, my, my friends who are not black could speak to me about anything and I wouldn't feel the sort of the treading on eggshells. Whereas now I can see the treading on eggshells. I can see people not trying to offend me. And maybe some might say that, you know, people are just becoming more thoughtful, but I don't know if we're becoming more thoughtful. I think we're becoming more fearful. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's something about making these categories primary. Mm -hmm seems incredibly dangerous because it brings you into kind of zero-sum game. Like, mm -hmm. it, just acknowledging that that's the primary way that we need to meet each other, I think, is 
that feels incredibly regressive Very much so. to me. But also there's an angle there which Coleman Hughes was talking to John McWhorter recently and he said what he found powerful about Martin Luther King was that Martin Luther King had this kind of spiritual, like he was a Christian pastor and he was able to sort of say we're all one in the eyes of God and he had this possibility of holding up this sort of other value system that wasn't just uh, identity politics. And Coleman asked the question, and I know you're talking to him fairly soon, so maybe I think this would be a really interesting thing to talk to him about. Is it possible? And he, he questioned, actually, whether it was possible to have a kind of, or whether you needed that kind of religious or spiritual perspective to be able to kind of, and I think you do, I think you do need some kind of religious or transcendental value to be able to unify beyond, because it's like, we do need to be aware of like there are racial disparities in some areas there are different experiences of the world that's kind of for me just basic empathy it's not mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be formalized as kind of intersectionality or this kind of elaborate yeah. value system but we have to have this sort of sense of what are we beyond what are we beyond our, our identity characteristics mm -hmm. and i think that feels like a really important distinction like we, we need to be aware of it, we can't hold it as primary. Yes, you know, you're completely right. Um, and I, I think what the thing is, is because a lot of people don't have this um, transcendental framework, for many people, I think their identity is the extent of who they are. So, you know, I meet lots of people now who are more likely to say, well, you know, I'm a feminist before human, you know, or I'm a black person before anything else. Um, and... While I'm not saying that anyone should have to negate, you know, aspects of their identity, but we should be aware because we deserve to know in our very one short life and the only provable life that we know um, that we are so much more than this, you know. And I often think the fixation with your identity, you know, limits your identity in many ways. Um, because whilst you're thinking, let's say, well, I'm a man and I'm from here, so that means I can't do this, I can't listen to this, I can't wear or go here, you know, it's, it's similar, you know. We often think that, well, I'm black and, you know, maybe you're white, so you can't understand my experience. You can't know anything about what I've been through. We can't find a point of relation. That's just not true. Um, and I think we know it's not true. Um, because whether it's um, discrimination you may have experienced because of your skin color, maybe not, but you could have faced discriminations of other kinds, you know, that can feel um, just as, as powerful, you know, or just as hurtful. Um, and we can relate there. And even if you haven't, I just don't think I would like to assume uh, that the, the pigmentation of your skin means that you lack empathy and you lack compassion because the other side of that is then maybe, uh, you know, me having this identity means that I could lack this and lack that. If we're saying it's true for one, then, you know, there has to be something undesirable that's true on my side as well. Um, so, yeah, it just... To, for the most part, fundamentally, uh, why I think a lot of racial discussions that we're having in public now feel, uh, again, quite corrosive is that it just feels dishonest to um, our everyday interactions. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and there's something just very profoundly unhuman about the idea that it's impossible for me to understand someone's experience. Mm -hmm. Like it, it may be very difficult for me to understand someone's experience, but by engaging in conversation, by engaging in empathy, by engaging in our human capacities, we can empathize. Maybe I won't know fully what it was like to live your life, but, I, but the idea that I cannot know possibly, there was a slogan during the recent Black Lives Matter uh, protest, which was something like, I, I, I understand, I will never understand, nevertheless I stand as a kind of ally. And on the face of it, it, it was like, yeah, solidarity. But, it, but within that felt like, I, I was kind of very ambivalent about it because it's like, I understand I will never understand. It's like that for me is the death of empathy. It's the death of art. It's the death of so much of the common human experience. And I think it just, it ends up siloing us off in a place where we can never get past. Like how, how can we get, if we can't get past that, we can't have a, like we're dooming ourselves to kind of isolation from each other. Yeah, no, exactly. And there's this assumption that, you know, every black person can understand, you know, the experience of another, which is also not true, mm. you know, like that's, and we know it's not true. And so I don't know sometimes if we're saying things because, you know, 
uh, you know, they're pithy and they sound nice. Uh, and, and so because they sound nice, they, they, they should make sense. Um, but that's just, yeah, again, I think that's always what I just come back to. It's just, it's just not true. There are plenty of black people whose experience I haven't had, you know, because it, it sort of works from this uh, presumption that all black people are experiencing the same thing, you know, and that we all feel that our lives have been minimized and, and reduced because of the way other people perceive us. And that's not true. Um, no matter what type of person you are, you're always going to have uh, people project things onto you. You know, you're always going to have maybe people uh, perceive you as something you may not be. I don't know if we can get away from this in the human experience. Um, but to say that all of those um, projections that other people have had, especially the negative ones, have to colour my entire experience and the entire way that I see myself, um, is profoundly damaging to me, I think. Um, and it's just not true. Yeah. yeah, I want to talk a little bit about, because I feel like so much of this conversation is being influenced by the American conversation. Mm. We seem to have imported a lot of the categories wholesale. And I think there are very different dynamics there that are, that are, very, that are completely different, like the, the legacy of slavery and the legacy of kind of redlining and long-term disadvantage are very different and I, I guess you're Nigerian originally so you don't have the, the same background in slavery. I'd be really interested in sort of those differences. Mm -hmm. I often don't feel like I see enough of a meaningful difference in the conversations. Um, again, uh, I think you said it, you know, it does seem like we import uh, the conversation wholesale and, you know, apply it to the UK and I'm not sure if that's wise. I mean, it's not even that I'm not sure. I don't think that's wise to do because they are different. There are different legacies and, and different present day um, issues. Um, and I guess this is the, uh, the issue with the internet, I guess, is that it doesn't leave much space for, for difference and nuance and complication. Um, but no, I don't personally think I see much of a difference. You said you have, no one's tried to cancel you yet. But what are the criticisms that you've had? Um, you know what, I'm, again, I've been fairly lucky, um, and maybe the next time I, I come back and speak to you, it'll be a completely different story. Um, but I don't actually get much pushback and I don't actually get much criticism, um, at least that I've seen and I don't go looking through comments. Every now and then I get someone message me um, and they say that your worldview seems very privileged. It seems that something like only a privileged person could do because, you know, I often say that you know, we're, we're more than our identities. And some people think that, um, well, I can't be more than my identity because wherever I go, my identity is made an issue. It's a problem. Um, and I will dialogue with this person back and I'll just say, well, again, you, you, can't, you can't base your identity and sense of self on the people who misunderstand it. You know, that doesn't seem like a healthy way to live. You know, of course people read me in all kinds of ways, uh, uh, whether that is about my race, sexuality, or, you know, just gender, whatever. Uh, the way I present myself, I'm sure lots of people have stereotypes sometimes. That's also not my problem, you know? It doesn't have to be, you know, your problem. Um, so I think there is some people um, who might think I have a romantic, privileged um, kumbaya uh, way of seeing the world um, and I, I, don't, I don't think so of course um, uh, I do think it's a privilege to finally recognize that we have more in common than we do apart uh, I don't think we have to be privileged to come across this type of information but it is a, a very big privilege onto the self when we do um, see this um, and it makes our navigation through life um, a lot more enriching um, and uh, you can really have some truly beautiful connections when you do open yourself up to this uh, way of seeing. Mm. And what are the conversations that you feel are not happening at the moment? Because for me certainly I feel there was an amazing podcast recently with uh, Brett Weinstein had a black intellectual round table with um, Colin Hughes, Chloe Valdery, John Wood Jr., John McWhorter, Glenn Lowry, 
and uh, Thomas Chatterton Williams. Thomas Chatterton Williams, yeah, I've had yeah, him on the yeah, channel, yeah. shouldn't okay, forget nice. that one. Yeah. And Kameli Foster. Foster. Yeah. Um, which was amazing. Like it was it was they they certainly had very different views. Some were kind of pro reparation, some were not, but they were all grappling with this sort of conversation about how much of the underachievement of the black community in America, for example, is to do with structural racism? How much is it to do with ongoing discrimination? How much is it to do with historical factors? How much is it to do with cultural factors? And it feels like, for me, the big problem is that we're in a, we're in a worldview that seems to only, the only acceptable explanation seems to be ongoing discrimination right now. And that seems like a very narrow perspective because I th feel like we have to bring in all of these different frames to be able to understand it. What are the, what are the things that you feel are not being, uh, the conversations are not being had? Yeah, I, w I would say as far as uh, racial discourse goes, I, I think we need to be able to give uh, equal weight to all of those things. So whether they are cultural factors, um, we can look at systemic issues. I mean, that is predominantly what we do right now. You know, we don't really give much space to anything else. Um, something that I'm very interested in is um, is the self-esteem of uh, minority people. So whether that is, whether this is someone who feels marginalized by their sexuality, someone who feels marginalized by their race, um, self-esteem, I think, um, plays a big uh, factor in how you see the world and how you see yourself, irrespective of what barriers may exist, may or may not exist. Um, and so that is something that I think is crucial and is something that I, I hope to encourage to raise um, throughout my work because then it's much easier to, to live in a world where, you know, because we can't control other people. People will always um, be fearful if they want to be fearful, discriminatory if they want to be discriminatory, and, and so on and so forth. But you can change how you see yourself. You can change like, how you deal with such situations. Um, and when we recognize, for me, when it comes to a lot of, let's say, actual racist people, which I, I, I meet less and less, uh, which is, is good, but uh, you know, I recognize racism to be a um, sort of like a reflection of one's own ignorance, um, lack of understanding of their own selves, like inferiority, you know, and so it's, it's not threatening to me, you know, it's something I pity, you know, it's not something that, um, it's not something that can, I don't know, necessarily outrage me in, in such a way. And I think we need to spend more time um, philosophically, maybe, trying to understand and emotionally, what is racism, you know, underneath it all, like actual racism, uh, not just the way that we throw around the term, you know, or the way that we throw around the term white supremacist or something like that. You know, I think we need to actually think about how do people, you know, harbor these views and, 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 and not just white people, because again, you know, I, I think everybody can be racist or be racially discriminatory. Um, it's just semantics. Uh, if you don't want to use the term racism because you don't think black people can be racist, racist, whatever, but we can still be racially discriminatory and prejudiced. Um, and I think we need to be able to, um, we need to be able to contend with people who might have bigoted views without necessarily saying that that means their whole entire character is utterly flawed and you know we should put them in the bin uh, because it's going to be harder for people to acknowledge that they have some biases and, and maybe some negative racial stereotypes um, if we are also saying well this means that you are a hideous you know morally impure person that's irredeemable. Um, no one is going to want to self-reflect under such an environment. Um, so, for one, I think we should stop necessarily treating racist attitudes as like the ultimate moral sin, if I'm honest, because um, it's ignorant and it's foolish, but it's definitely not something that makes you an irredeemable person who should be cast out of public life. Uh, I, I think we need to communicate with each other more. Um, sorry, this was a really long way of doing this. Um, your question actually was, though, um, what are we not talking about? Um, so in terms of, yeah, what we're not talking about, I would, I would agree with uh, a lot of the conversations that happened on Brett Weinstein's uh, podcast. Uh, I do think we need to 
pay attention to the things outside of discrimination. Because in one's own life, it's rare that the things that are making your life difficult are solely about this external factor. It's very, very, very rare. You know, even if we think about a romantic relationship, this romantic relationship breaks down. It's very rare that it's solely the other person, you know, who's making this relationship break down. You know, even if they have the more hostile, aggressive behavior, the question will soon return, well, why am I still in this? You know, and so I do think we, um, yeah, we need to be able to look at reasons beyond discrimination uh, without, without, um, without being defensive, you know, without suggesting that people who want to have that conversation are ill-intended. Anybody who really cares about um, marginalized people, black people, and really wants to see um, the black race, you know, get to a get to a point that is a bit more progressive or whatever, um, you are going to want to think about it from all angles. You have to, you know, otherwise you are kind of like shooting your own aims in the foot. So, yeah, I think we have to. That is what it means to care, is yeah. to look at all aspects. And what I've really loved just listening to some of your podcasts and then we've exchanged a few messages is... On Rebel Wisdom, we've got kind of a, a few different frameworks that we talk about, and we've talked about kind of polyvagal theory and the value of curiosity. We've talked about integral theory and the value of kind of multiple perspectives. And you are, you're, you're talking about all of, all of the same stuff. You're basically, you sent me a message saying how valuable curiosity was. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, have you heard of polyvagal theory? And you're like, no. And it's like, mm -hmm. have you heard of integral theory? No. And it's like, so, so refreshing. Um, that because I speak to a lot of people who are kind of saying a lot of the same uh, things, but have often got a kind of theoretical background in this in this world, or they're using a map that they've got from sort of somewhere or other. But you're you've kind of very directly kind of made your way there under your own steam, which in some ways kind of reassures me that those maps are actually pointing to something real because you don't need to know about them to be able to see that. Um, but I'm interested in asking you about that, especially curiosity. Because you said something beautiful in one of the messages that it takes you somewhere, the value of it is that it takes you somewhere new, mm -hmm. or that it's it's a very sort of, it, by definition, it's a, it's an individual journey. I think was mm -hmm. something. Can you talk a bit about curiosity? Yeah, um, curiosity is probably um, something I, I value um, higher than most things. Um, I think when we're curious about each other, for one, I, I think it allows us to see this commonality that we have. Um, it makes us less reactive. And I think when you're, when you're curious, you know, I don't think you have the same rush to, uh, to condemn. I don't think you have the same rush to criticize. Um, it's the, the foundation of understanding. And, and I really just think that understanding is, is just so crucial. You know, I, I, I don't think there's many sort of, um, material things that I, I value highly, but you know, I'm very hyper aware that this is a very impermanent existence, uh, too hyper aware. And so it seems to me that the best way to honor that, uh, that fact is to, is to be curious and is to um, really get to know ourselves while we're here. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, it just, it seems to be the foundation of everything, uh, of everything transformative. Mm. And that's why I think curiosity is something we can't afford to lose. And especially right now when we're living in this um, attention uh, economy, um, it's harder to be curious. You have to fight for your curiosity now because you know we're told what to believe and we're told what we should be thinking about. Mm. And there's also something about vulnerability that, that I think is really important. Mm. Like you, you're prepared to talk about kind of your doubts and your, mm -hmm. um, your personal background as well in public, which I think is really important as well. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be something about that that's necessary, again, to get out of this situation that we're in. Like just showing that we're all human, just yes, showing that we all yes, have these. Yes, of course. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm far from a yogi, you know, and I, I very much have my own battles and struggles and issues with self-doubt. Um, but, you know, I often think a lot of the... Um, the mental sort of textures that we have that are not very delightful. You know, I, I really think they're there to teach us something. 
you know. So even if it's something like anxiety, I think anxiety is often a clue, you know, as to to that maybe you're you're anxious around a certain someone or in a certain space. It's it's, it's tapping at you and saying like, okay, what is it about this place or this person that you know is not okay with me? You know, it's asking you to do some work. And so uh, yeah, equally maybe even things like depression. Like I think if we're looking, we can find um, use for these things. Doesn't mean I think we have to, we don't have to live in these situations, but we can find use for them. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for me to, to try and present someone that's, I don't know, not human. I, I wouldn't be able to do that very well. Mm. And there was something you said in your, um, your talk about conflict is conformist, mm -hmm. which I think is really, that's a really important thought, especially now because we're being pushed towards polarization and division by um, the big tech platforms because that generates more interest. The more wired we are, the more likely we are to keep kind of checking Twitter, seeing if anyone's replied to a kind of comment on Facebook. Like they are, we are being pushed more and more towards what we had Tristan Harris on our podcast recently who talked about the battle to the bottom of the brainstem. Mm. Like we're, we're triggering for outrage, we're triggering for the more kind of primal emotions. So I love that idea, like conflict is actually conformist, is a really beautiful. Yeah. I thought about doing, putting it on a t-shirt? I uh, know, but I, I should do, thank you for that. Um, but it is, I do believe conflict is conformist because it's knee-jerk, you know, it's, it's, it's just so reactionary and it's just what we've always done. You know, we've always had conflict with each other, but it's very rare that we've been able to understand each other. It's very rare that we can sit with something deeply uncomfortable or deeply disagreeable to our ideas and rather than condemn someone for them, but ask, why do you have these ideas? You know, it's that takes, uh, that to me is a radical act because it's harder to do, we're not encouraged to do it, there's less applause for doing it. You know, someone might say, you're humanizing the oppressor or something like that, or an abuser. Um, but if it's happening within humans, then it is human. You know, we need to humanize it. We need to, you know, humanizing it doesn't necessarily mean condoning such behavior. It just means that you are prepared to explore it. Um, so, uh, sorry, what was, the, what was the thing that you said? Conflict. Conflict. So, um, how did I get back into that? And so these are the reasons as to why I think conflict is conformist, because it's unthinking, you just do it. Uh, but to, to be more understanding is a considered, you know, response. You know, it's, it's practice. It's, it's um, trying to overcome your compulsions. How do we do it? <laughs> How do we do it, David? It's a good question. We do it, I think one of the principal ways that we do it is um, by recognizing and fully contending with our own capacity for destruction. You know, really holding the, the ugly parts of what it means to be human and recognizing that they are in us. Um, and then maybe thinking about what prevents us from maybe acting within those ways. You know, maybe we've had a great family, maybe we've had shelter, support, you know, education, um, and then recognizing where those things may be missing for other people. And I don't know, you just start to, you just start to see people more clearly, you know? And, and so I think that is how we become more more responsive and that's maybe how we increase empathy is by uh, recognizing that maybe there are no good people uh, there are only you know people who are flawed trying to be better that's it we're all at different stages of that yeah and I mean I have done a lot of as I've talked about on the channel I've done kind of a lot of kind of spiritual work personal growth work group work and there's something about the energy that comes in when you're really honest with someone, like you, you're kind of talking about your life, you're sharing kind of personal stuff and you just realize that there's a, there's a space that comes in, there's a feeling of actual togetherness mm. that kind of you could criticize as being like a, it's a very middle class affectation, it's something that kind of, yeah, it's something that some people can do but a lot of people can't afford to. And I had an experience not that long ago where I volunteered for a group called Band of Brothers so they do uh, mentoring for disadvantaged kids, basically. People who just come out of the criminal justice system and they match people up with mentors. They go through a kind of rite of passage. And 
I volunteered with them in, in Hackney and it was by far the most racially mixed group. I've kind of, na not just racially mixed, but also mixed in terms of class. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a lot of kind of um, working class Jamaican guys, working class kind of different Afro-Caribbean communities. And what was astonishing is that everyone had the background of sort of having gone through this rite of passage, talking about themselves, talking about their struggles, their hopes, their fears, their weaknesses. And it, it was kind of, it was magical what happened. Like that was genuine community. And I feel like a lot of the time, especially kind of guilty white liberal, kind of want to be like, oh no, we're all, we're all together. I'm, I'm not racist. I'm, it's like, there's a kind of efforting in that sort of sense of multiculturalism where you're not really sharing these people's lives. You kind of come in and out of their communities. You, you actually struggle to get your events looking anything like other than just your kind of white community. There is something about if we're able to go into that space of vulnerability with each other, that everyone, no matter where you're from, no matter what your class background is, you have struggles in your life. You have difficulties, you have beliefs about yourself that you can talk about. Something magical happens when we're able to go into a space where we're actually able to express that. And that, that for me, seems to be just such an important part of the, of the puzzle for like genuine humanity, genuine connection. Mm. Um, and I, I feel like the problem is we're in an environment, especially with social media, that militates against any of that. Mm. Like we don't share anything personal. We don't feel we're in a safe space to do that because we're not a lot of the time. It might be taken against us. It might be taken out of context. All of these sort of things. But it's like that for me. Is the, the humanity somehow needs to come back in, and I don't know. I don't know how we do it, mm. but it just feels like that's a really important. Yeah. No, I agree piece. with you. I, I think. Um, Honesty is that thing that, you know, allows us to transcend all these shallow, superficial differences. Um, and we're so, yeah, you're right, we're, we're not encouraged to be honest, we're, we're encouraged to be right, you know, a lot of the time. And we're encouraged to, you know, have a take, make a point, you know, maybe safe spaces yeah, at their most effective would be good if they, actually brought people who are unlikely to talk together, you know, so uh, interracial, intergenerational, you know, left and right, you know, and, 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 and hash out things. I think that's probably, I mean, because if you're, if you're insulating yourself around other people who are just like you, I mean, that can happen quite easily in life anyway, without a safe space, you know, it could just be the area that you've grown up in, in your friendship groups. Um, but yeah, I think safe spaces, um, if there are to be any use for them, I think it's in bringing different types of people together. Um, because we do, you know, that one of the issues I, I think for me uh, with this self-censorship that we're all going through right now is that there's a, there's a, there's a mental consequence to this. There's a mental consequence and, a, and an emotional consequence to having to swallow everything, to um, being paranoid. You know, and thinking that your friends are going to dislike you, if, you know, I don't know, maybe they find out that you listen to Jordan Peterson, you know, or whatever it may be, you know, thinking that, um, you know, all of these paranoid thoughts that we have now, you know, we, we kind of almost maybe sensibly have to have. Um, I think there is a real consequence to that that is not going to be um, useful or conducive uh, to the to the individual and to the group. Um, because we're sort of inviting everybody to lie to us for the sake of our own comfort, you know. And I would rather know about the world that I live in, you know, as, as, as ugly as it can be. Um, and I think when we're equipped to, to withstand, you know, the, uh, the more undesirable parts of humanity, we might be equipped to overcome some of it. Did you listen to Jordan Peterson? Oh, I definitely did. <laughs> um, no, I think, I mean, I, of course, you know, there's, there's probably things that I, I'd like to discuss with him that I'm, I'm not necessarily sure about, but, you know, I don't think uh, Jordan Peterson is the, the person that everybody thinks he is. You know, I don't think he's uh, this evil conservative who's a bigot and, and all those kinds of things. I think he represents, uh, as we can see, you know, from his, his audience, I think he, he represents uh, a feeling and a sense that a lot of people feel. Um, and also with his more kind of 
spiritual dimensions, you know, I think that's a testament to how much uh, people want something like that. People are, are desperate for something uh, that sounds or can feel hopeful. You know, we keep hearing about what's wrong with the world and uh, why it's terrible and why it doesn't care about any of us. I think, you know, it's been a long time since someone's come in and maybe said, actually, you can make your life, you know, what you want it to be. Um, I think that's very, uh, very persuasive and, and very encouraging for people. Um, yeah, I'm cool with it. Yeah, and mm -hmm. in the, the conversation you had with Alan de Botton, mm -hmm. you talked about feeling lonely and feeling that you needed community or were looking for community. Mm -hmm. Do you still feel that way or do you feel that you're finding more of it? I think I'm finding more of it. I think I've accepted that I'm quite um, a solitary person. Um, I think I'm better without a group uh, and without a tribe. I think it allows me to make sure I'm being honest with myself because I think once I start feeling like I want a political side or a home somewhere beyond myself, um, that's when I might start you know, not saying certain things because I don't know how these people are going to take it. Um, so no, I still don't, I don't know if the word is community but I have a lot of loving, um, supportive people in my life and on the internet and, and people who are always saying the kindest things. Considering we, you know, we often think that the internet and social media in particular is like a hellhole. Uh, my experience there is genuinely quite good. Yeah, people are really kind to me and, and often very encouraging. And I meet people of all types, of, all across the political spectrum. Like, you know, I have genuine MAGA followers and, you know, I've got some hardcore Marxists and um, it's nice to be able to dialogue, you know, with both and sort of just come in peace. It's nice. And are you concerned about how you could be potentially used or how your words could be used? Mm -hmm. Because it does. It, there is such a thing at the moment of kind of... Um, guilt by association of appearing on certain podcasts that you're maybe seen as a certain, in a certain way, or do you, do you, are you concerned about that? Do you worry about, I mean, I, cause I, I personally, I think that what you, what you really offer, as I've said, is this sort of, this real level of empathy, but there is a market for kind of anti-woke stuff. And there is a sort of temptation to be sort of maybe dragged a little bit further and further into a more reactive space. And I've seen that happen to people over the last few years, there are some, there are some shows that have become more and more just let's bash the left, let's bash the left, the left is going crazy. And for me, that's just adding to the division rather than trying to hold up a place be beyond it, which is what I feel that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel a little almost like a sense of... Um, is it protection? Protection, almost mm -hmm. a sense of protection. It's like, you, yeah, I would hate for that to happen. I don't think it would happen to mm. you personally, but I am a little bit worried that you might be sort of seen in a certain way if you if you are sort of seen as being aligned with certain people mm. yes um i wish it wasn't something that i had to consider but i do consider it maybe not maybe not as heavily as some people would like because i feel if i'm too hyper aware of who could use me or who might misinterpret my message, then I'm not going to say what I think. And, and that for me is, is worse. That, that feels like a, a self-imposed prison. Um, so I don't want to do that, but I think I'm very aware of, you know, I'm under no illusion about why even, you know, I I'm in, this, in the room of certain conversations. You know, I'm aware that it's my identity. I'm aware that I am saying things that a lot of people who don't look like me can't get away with saying. Um, and so because I'm very hyper aware of that, I, it's quite easy to see. And I don't, I don't blame them, you know, I don't blame them. I don't, I don't see it as um, them even necessarily being ill-intended. You know, I, we're all sort of possessed at the moment with this, culture war stuff and this uh, need to prove that we are right. Um, I think I can feel it. I think I can spot it quite easily. Um, and yeah, and so that sort of, that tells me and directs me where I should go and where I shouldn't go. Um, but the problem is, or at least I, I'd like there to be enough scope on, you know, maybe some mainstream left channels um, for discussion because that's 
the consequence, you know, if, the, if, you, if you're not very uh, accepting of different viewpoints, then the only people who are going to pick up, you know, nuanced viewpoints or anything like that are going to be people in the center or people on the right, um, people that you might, you know, have some preconceived notion of. Um, so this is doubly why, you know, we need to be able to open up conversation on all sides so you're not slowly pushing people um, to one place. Um, but no, in, in, in an idle world, I speak to everybody because, you know, I, I am genuinely interested in, in everyone and especially people who do not see the world in the way that I do. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I, I think I've, I've, I've got a good sense of, you know, where to be and why. Yeah, because yeah, I, I wish it didn't, it wasn't the case that you did have to kind of be aware of that, but I think you do. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think that you have a possibility of being quite a, a person who bridges different tribes. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we've talked quite a lot about mm -hmm. on, on the channel, the idea of mimetic tribes and mimetic mediation, which is like who can talk to these different tribes without uh, activating the immune system of the different mm -hmm. tribes. You know, certain topics will activate the immune system and they'll be like, okay, you're on that side or mm -hmm. that side. And I think I'd, I'd love to see, I think you have the opportunity to do that because I think you're, you're certainly coming from a very empathetic place and I think that will, that will serve you well in the future. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do next. Yeah, hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm down to genuinely talk to anybody who's willing to have respectful conversation and who wants to move past, you know, the conversations into some kind of like action um, of how we can, you know, yeah, try to try to decrease the polarization and, and the conflict and yeah, become more self-aware. Aisha, thank you very much. Thank you. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon.